Welcome back to another video pilots, 343 has released one of the biggest Inside Infinite updates I have ever seen. I'm not going to include every little thing so as to not make this video super long, so if you want to read over everything, be sure to check out the blog post itself. It's going to be a long one, so strap in and let's dive into all the juicy details. The update starts off with introducing the character team. We are joined by Steve Dick, character and combat director on Infinite, Brian Repka, character art lead for Infinite's campaign, Juan Carlos Laria, animation lead on the character team, and finally, Nick Avalon, senior animator on the character team. We are then provided with a beautiful render of the UNSC Marines, which are in-engine but also being viewed with developer tools, so keep in mind most of the images that look like this are not fully representative of their final look in-game. We then jump straight into explaining what exactly the character team does at 343. We've spoken with a variety of teams across Halo Infinite and they've each shared some versions of pillars or goals that help inform and inspire the work they do. What does that entail for the character team? These are the high level goals of the character combat team keeps in mind while making decisions on AI combatants and measuring if we feel we have been successful in our delivery. Create compelling AI combatants. This is addressed by both aesthetic and gameplay. We want clear reasons around the role of our AI and why a designer would choose to use a grunt versus a brute, jackal, or elite. Each one of these characters should bring a unique experience to combat. This differentiation is most important when we look at our base level enemies. For example, a brute versus an elite versus a grunt versus a jackal, and so on. Within each one of those base characters, we also create variants that support different roles and gameplay challenges. Another thing we talked about early in production was embracing the sci-fi. What is meant by this, with Halo being a sci-fi franchise, we have an opportunity to try different things with different alien species that a lot of other shooters do not. Player Comprehension This is also addressed by both aesthetic and gameplay. We strive for the player to understand who they are engaging in battle with, and why one target may be more important to take out than others. We do this with a combination of art, animation, design choices, and behaviors. In addition to this, Player feedback is an especially important factor when addressing this goal. Whether it be the scale of a hit reaction, effects feedback, or what an AI says, it should all contextually make sense to the player and help them understand if what they are doing is effective or whether they need to change tactics. This is all great to hear. Halo has historically been pretty good at placing the right enemies in the right places. The return of so many variants within enemy types is also nice. We saw the return of enemy ranks during the campaign overview on Monday. Also, the gameplay feedback players receive is such an important part of a good game. Lots of games feel unsatisfactory or even unrewarding when things like bullets and damage do not have any sort of visual or audible feedback. We are then provided a render of what is being called a Spartan Killer. I believe these unnamed Spartan Killers, unlike the named ones such as Jaga, are the mini bosses we will be fighting throughout the campaign. I'm looking forward to facing off against all the bosses in the game. Next. The team is asked how they have tread the line of keeping new and old together for what is being called a spiritual reboot. I agree that Halo Infinite feels like it is. The spiritual reboot actually made it easier for us to incorporate some more legacy designs into the characters. One of the best examples of this are the Elites, Grunts, and Jackal, who all have a much more legacy design to them than we had in Halo 4 or 5. In terms of which part of the legacy we looked to for inspiration, we settled most around the Halo 3 Halo Reach timeframe, and then incorporated the banished aesthetic where it made sense along with the Halo Infinite art direction. From an art standpoint, we knew early on that we wanted to spiritually reboot our characters, and that meant taking a look at all of our characters. Every character in Infinite was redesigned in some way. Like Steve mentioned, we really relied on the designs of the past. We wanted to get back to the legacy designs that made Halo characters iconic but we didn't just want to just up res them. We wanted to add our own flair while staying true to the 20 years of history. I will use the elites as an example. In Halo 4 and Halo 5, the elites were big and bulky. We ended up scaling them down a bit and giving them a more sleek look. We wanted them to be fast, agile, and intelligent. We knew this would also be a great contrast to the big hulking brutes. I couldn't be happier with how the elites look and perform in Infinite. Having elites specifically return to their more slender look is a great change in my opinion. As stated, it provides a more clear distinction between the savage brutes and the intelligent elites. 
While I did enjoy the designs of enemies from Halo 4 and 5, I do think the targeted Halo 3 and Reach era has the best in terms of style. The Banish style is being incorporated nicely into a lot of the designs, but I have noticed some that feel like they aren't really convincingly banished, like the Hunters we saw on Monday. Perhaps it's just a rank of Hunter, and there will be more banished looking Hunters in the game. We are then treated to a nice render of an Elite, probably yelling out wart warts at the Chief. The team is then asked how it was to bring Brutes back to Halo after being gone for so long, as well as incorporating a faction that has only been in a non-mainline title in the extended universe until now. The return of the Brutes was a challenge the team was very excited to pursue, as they are a great adversary in the Halo universe. We wanted the Brutes to feel very aggressive, but not like dumb space monkeys. We talked a lot about the desire for Brutes to feel more visceral as well. The player will experience this in everything from the way they attack, how their armor can be shot off, and the VO they use. Brutes, as an enemy, are a nice juxtaposition from a character like the Elite that tends to be more composed and tactical. The Brutes are all about brute force, for a lack of a better way of putting it. And this shows through in the gameplay. For example, where an Elite might peel off from combat and take cover, a Brute will be more likely to charge the player in a rage. One of our main focuses from the player's perspective was to create a sense of visual damage that set the Brutes apart from other enemies. As you fight the Brutes, you will see all kinds of armor and debris flying off them from shoulder pad to thigh pads to helmets shooting across the map. Knowing this, we knew we had to design the armors in such a way that facilitated this. We designed the Brute tech suit with various attachment points so that we could modulize the armor plates so they could be shot off. Funny enough, early on, one of the challenges that we had with this approach was in certain cases, by the time you finished off a Brute, he would be pretty much naked and bare. This is why they flaunt a full body tech suit. The team had an absolute blast working on them. Having combat behavior variation like this is a definite plus for Infinite. It should help Encounter stay fresh and prevent them from feeling samey. The addition of armor breaking off, at least on the Brutes, is a nice touch as well. We could see this in the campaign overview when Master Chief decks a Brute with a gravity hammer. I also can't imagine finishing up a firefight to just see a bunch of naked Brutes on the ground. No armor. Very funny idea, but glad they added tech suits to make it less awkward. Animations in the game are looking great as well. Each enemy moves like it should, and the way Brutes can tumble when they lose their footing is still something I really enjoy. We are then shown a Brute Berserker, a Brute that seems to rely solely on melee combat. We have seen one in action already, charging at the Chief. That was actually Craig's cousin, Greg. What a chat. On the topic of Craig, we actually get the character team asked about Craig, as well as what's been worked on since last year's demo. The team has a sort of love-hate relationship with Craig. While it was fun to see the community gravitate towards Craig, he unfortunately represented some content and systems that were not ready for prime time in that demo. The positive outcome of Craig was that he was one of the factors in gaining some more time to finish work and get Brutes to a place where the team is happy with them. This is one of the many positive examples of 343 working with and aligning with the Halo community around expectations. Players who look hard enough will still be able to find some evidence of Craig in the Halo Infinite. His spirit lives on. Craig is in good hands, trust me. He has gone through some changes, but I am here to say that he has glammed up. He is feeling very good about himself and has fit back in well with the rest of his brute friends. He has also picked up a new hobby and has done well for himself. Long live Craig. I'm glad Craig is doing well for himself. After the year he had, he deserves it. But on a serious note, I can imagine seeing unfinished work being spread around so much can be somewhat disheartening. But as they said, it allowed them the time to finally get the Brutes where they wanted. We get a close-up view of a Brute that is Craig? I'm not sure since the wording under the image makes it seem like a random Brute and Craig at the same time. Next, Steve gives a comprehensive breakdown of how characters and gameplay are made and how one affects the other. We try to drive AI combatant character creation from a gameplay need as much as possible. We will look for a role that we are missing or is underrepresented and that we think we would be interested to fight from a player perspective. We talk about what will make this character unique from other AI combatants and try to develop what we would often refer to as a character's special sauce. If a new character did not have special sauce and was just an analog for an existing character in the game, then there isn't a lot of justification for making that a new character. For example, there aren't a lot of characters in Halo that put the player back on their heels. The Elite Zealot is a good example, but you don't see them a lot, which is part of their appeal. So we look at that and say, 
Are there other characters that can fill a similar role? Should we add more? These discussions ultimately lead to things like the Brood Berserker, which fills a gameplay need and is a strong fit for the Brood's aggressive personality. Once we have a role defined, a paper design, we will start working with concept on very loose sketches and start doing a rough in-game prototype to help establish silhouette, proportions, etc. that in turn inform concept. If a prototype is fun and compelling, we will continue to refine across the board with higher fidelity art, animations, and start adding some audio, effects, etc. If the prototype isn't fun, then it's back to step one to discuss where things went off the rails, and if we can get them back on track. If we are going to fail, we want to do so as quickly as possible before we start bringing in more disciplines. The most important thing at this stage is it's okay to have a prototype fail as long as the team is learning and making more informed decisions as we move forward. As we go further through the process, eventually we get into full production on a character where the team is working on content, design tuning, and code that will be part of shipping a character. Narrative characters can be a little different where they are driven more from a story need as opposed to a gameplay need. The pilot is a good example of this where his role fills many narrative needs, but is much lighter on the gameplay side of things. With that said, the same amount of diligence and rigor goes into making these narrative characters a reality. Firstly, the idea of characters being made solely to fit certain roles in the game is great. I think that is personally a better way to make characters for a game than making them outside the gameplay and then making them fit in after. Though as stated, narrative characters do not need to be created to fill a role, since they are mostly for the story. Also, prototyping and not being afraid to give up when something isn't fun or is good to hear. Halo 4 had lots of issues with unfun enemies and lack of roles being filled, or actually, too many of the same role being filled. We get a nice render of the pilot in all his glory. I seriously can't wait to help him get back to his home, his wife, and kid. He deserves it after all he's been through. Next, we get an idea of how returning enemy types are being treated in Halo Infinite. So there has been a lot rebuilt from the ground up for Halo Infinite in terms of AI behavior that absolutely takes the evolved sandbox and more open gameplay into consideration. For example, those new fusion coils a player can grab and throw can also be thrown by brutes. At times, a brute may even toss a grunt at the player. The other thing we need to support on the character side is the effectiveness of things like the new equipment versus characters. The evolution of the sandbox has given the player more options in combat. For example, the grapple shot will pull you to a brute, be deflected by a hunter, and not attached to a jackal, but will pop their shield to the side so the player can damage onto the body. Another evolution that may surprise players is some of our smarter AI will upgrade their weapon, when possible, by grabbing a better weapon off a rack, the ground, or even a grunt mule. I noticed this in the trailer that AI, enemy and friendly, pick up and use weapons off the ground. We see a marine doing it in the rescue scene from the overview, and a brute wielding a commando near the start of the overview. And win against impossible odds. Chief? Infinite invites players to become Master Chief and discuss this is such an unexpected but welcome addition to the gameplay sandbox of the campaign. We then get a good look at the jackals. They look like the scariest they have ever been in Halo Infinite, but yet somehow the cutest too. They look like little dinos so much in this game, I'm all for it. Moving on, the team is then asked what armor styles, color, and weapons of choice for enemy ranks do in the sense of gameplay, as for lore reasons, it is rather obvious. This is a great part of Halo's legacy, and I think is equally as impactful now as it was 20 years ago. The use of vibrant color to help the player identify threats or variations of enemies is a key part of Halo. I can still remember in Halo CE when I first saw a gold elite and was like, who's that? This is a legacy we are continuing with Halo Infinite as it is great for the player feedback and Halo as a game. From a gameplay standpoint, in a shooter, at times your target can be small on screen and it might be hard to know if your enemy is carrying a plasma pistol or a stalker rifle. This is where color and silhouette can be informative to the player in terms of target prioritization and support gameplay at the same time as supporting a rich visual set of enemies that is iconic to Halo. Fictionally, we look at the different armors as being in line with function as well as aesthetic, distinction of rank on the battlefield. While we go further than say modern military uniforms, it is a distinction of rank within the enemy faction. As I mentioned before, having these ranks is simply a must for Halo. Without a clear visual indicator of what you're up against, you can get unpleasantly surprised. For example, in Halo 4, Sniper Knights were only distinguishable by a weapon that blends in with their own color, 
and a ring around its head that only appears when it's aiming. Otherwise, they were identical to every other knight. Lastly, they mentioned the Grunt Mule, which we are shown a render of, carrying the power weapons of its brute commanders. We then get a telling of what exactly Spartan killers are and where they come from creatively. From the start of Infinite, one of the things we wanted to pursue were more boss or mini-boss type characters. This evolved into conversations around how these could manifest themselves in the game. The Spartan killers were an early theme around an elite force of Banished that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Spartan and win. From there, we started talking about who they would be, what species, and what they could do that would set them apart from their factional counterparts in both gameplay and aesthetic. As funny as it might sound, we talked about the A-Team when it came to the red and black color theme of the Spartan killers. We just didn't give them the sweet van to ride around in. When the design brief for the Spartan killers came to us, it was hard to contain the excitement. A group of an elite banished force that was headhunting Spartans? Uh, yes please. We wanted to find a way to set this group apart from the rest of the enemies, but at the same time make sure that we have cohesion within the group itself. We went with the black armor theme that with splashes of red blades. Each Spartan killer is unique and has its own story and battle trophies. That's all I will say about that. So as I predicted, they are bosses and mini-bosses, some with more lore than others I assume like Jaga. Speaking of Jaga, we also got another look at him through an in-game render. The black and red color scheme is cool, and I'm not just saying that because it's a personal favorite combo of mine. It really resonates that Banished aesthetic, perfect for such a strong force within the Banished. Next, the team is asked about the new species, Skimmers. While we weren't given any lore information about them, we got plenty of gameplay information. I think that always flying enemies in FPS games are a pain most of the time, rarely done right, so having these little creatures be a sort of hybrid that focuses more on the ground is nice to hear. I'm curious about this line, the keep your tanks clear line. Perhaps skimmers can pull apart pieces of your vehicle like they are pulling apart that monitor. Ending with a render of two grunts, we wrap up the character study section of this Inside Infinite. The next team presenting their work is the user experience and user interface teams. There are a lot of members of this team joining us for this Inside Infinite. We have Vincent Hui, UX Design Lead, Chad Mershak, UI Art Lead, Paige Jonathan, Production Lead for UX, UI, and Accessibility, Eric Diaz, Realization Lead, Omar Yunez, Senior Visual Designer, Roxy Garza, Senior Creative Technologist, Casey Donaldson, Senior Technical UX Designer, and Ian Satterdallen, Coordinator for the UX, UI team. Before we get into any details, we are given an in-game screenshot from the campaign overview. Firstly, the team is asked about any design pillars they use to help them in their work, which Vincent explains as inviting, engaging, and intelligible interactions, while Chad says modern legacy, along with minimalist UI that lets the rest of the game shine without being overshadowed by the UI itself. We then get an in-game screenshot of the chief taking on some enemies in a banished base filled with UNSC vehicle scrap. We get a rundown of how campaign and multiplayer HUDs are different. Essentially, the campaign has more emphasis on assisting the storytelling, while multiplayer is more about the information at a glance idea. We then get an example of how the story is enhanced by UI elements such as this, which is part of what is called Visor OS. We can actually see how the Visor OS extends beyond the UI with some of the in-game items like vehicles and weapons. We also get a look at where more gameplay focused Visor alerts will look like with this suit upgrade message we will get after upgrading. There is also the mention of assassination dossiers for the campaign, which will be part of the targets menu. We also got descriptions of what each menu is for. We already know about the tack maps and upgrades, so let's take a look at the other three. The FOB tab is used to show the available items you have at your FOBs. The targets menu is for viewing what targets you need to eliminate, and the database tab is a compendium of narrative logs and collectibles. We get some nice screenshots of some menus that are different from what we saw in the campaign overview, with more or less things unlocked or visited. Next we get to move on to customization, what it was like to create the UX UI for these menus. Roxy describes the task as one of Herculean effort from all the teams involved. There's so many layers and people involved that making it all fit together perfectly is no walk in the park. Thankfully, the new menus for customization look stunning, and I think the team did a very good job. Something you might have noticed in the flights is that the preview images of armor actually have your Spartan's coating and other visible armor pieces shown. This is actually done using real 3D renders, 
this is much easier than making a new image for every possible permutation to exist ever. Great job on the team for adding this. We are also getting a nice way to view where items come from, called deep linking. An example given is if you don't have an item unlocked, it will say available in this battle pass at level X, and provide a link that brings you to that item in the pass. This is great for finding out what you have left to get, as well as the fact locked items are still shown in the customization menu. We also get a sorting and filtering tool, which is much needed for a game this size. We get a nice look at what the armor core selection screen will look like, with three cores available in the image. This looks more like Halo Reach than Halo Reach. We then get a look at the concepting work done to bring this menu to life. With that, we wrap up the look at the menus and their designs with a few looks at some in-game screenshots of the menus. Next, we dive deep into weapon decals and manufacturer logos. A lot of manufacturer logos have gotten redesigned to simplify their looks and make them more readable. Examples are shown to us here. One thing Eric mentions is that the team wanted to bring out that deep Halo lore through these new decals and logos. Something to please the lore fans who know their stuff. We get some images breaking down all the small details that go into making a weapon look real in the universe. These barcodes and other types of scan codes are actually something that work when scanned. General Heed actually has a video showing that off. There will be a card to go watch that in the top right. These weapon logos actually remind me of the weapon manufacturer logos from Borderlands. Next, they dive into a bit of info from the UX UI team with a look at accessibility, but all the information said here is things we already know from the Xbox Wire feature on accessibility in Infinite, as well as seeing it all from the flight itself. Capping off the UX UI section, we get told that the UX UI is just as equal to the rest of the game when it comes to changing and adding over time. So don't expect us to have the same UI and menus for the whole lifespan of Halo Infinite. Launch is just the beginning, there's still more the team wants to add. Next is the Tales from the Trenches, which covers some more personal aspects of the development process from everyone at 343. I recommend you head over to the blog post itself if you want to read over that, as none of the information said here pertains to new information or anything worth covering in the video. Lastly, we get Joe Staten and his final words as usual. This time around, he expresses his favorite part of the campaign overview, then he dives into the choice players are given in Halo Infinite, from being able to tackle bases from any direction and strategy, to using whatever equipment you see fit for the task. This was a daunting video to make, and I apologize if it did not come out quick enough. I still have yet to get used to the heavy workload that is making videos as fast as possible for newly released content. I hope I was able to add input and bring forth the information provided in this Inside Infinite in a meaningful way. If you liked the video, maybe like and subscribe, it helps the channel out. Thanks for watching this video, I'll see you next time, peace.